their lives are completely um, centred around their computers. I chat to friends and like do comments and stuff. Usually Facebooks and Hotmail and stuff. The kids come home and are on Facebook while they're having their first cup of tea. You can communicate with people and you can look into their lives and stuff. When I was young, we didn't even have a home telephone. Can you imagine life without the web? Um, no. No? <laughs> I think it would be like removing her arm if you took her Facebook site away from her. What do you think life was like before the web? Really boring. Yeah. What do you think people did? Read books. <laughs> By the time Generation Web reached adulthood, they'll have spent 10,000 hours online. And a huge proportion of those will have been spent on online social networks. For the first time on television, using a data sample of 8 million people, we can reveal how far the UK population has been sucked into the orbit of the online social networks. The size of each of these web planets represents the number of visits it receives over each month. There's Bebo for the early teens, MySpace for the music lovers, but the biggest of them all is Facebook. According to Facebook, 350 million people worldwide have Facebook accounts. If it were a country, it would be the third largest behind China and India. Britain is becoming a Facebook nation. There are 23 million active Facebook users. That's one in three of us. And that's right across the country. The Facebook capital of Great Britain is Sunderland. More than half of UK Facebook members log on daily, on average for an hour every time. It's so pervasive that Facebook has become the main target of parents' angst. People my age, mid-40s and up, are wringing their hands right over what kids are doing, teens are doing on Facebook. As if we would not have done those things had Facebook existed when we were young. How dare these children now not suffer the way I did? They should be having the kind of life I did, made to read, made to do this. They should not have this freedom, this access. Or if they do, while I can approve of it, I ought to suggest that it's dangerous, that it's going to go wrong. The key criticism of Facebook is that it makes friendship meaningless, and that undermines society. The label of friendship is just as easily attained by lifelong buddies as it is by total strangers hoarding connections. How true is this? To find out more, we need to understand why Facebook became so popular. On the 24th of May, 2007, just 10 days after his 23rd birthday, Mark Zuckerberg shuffled into this hall and explained the secret of Facebook's triumphant success. Today, together, we're going to start a movement. At Facebook, we're pushing to make the world a more open place. And we do this by Zuckerberg's aim was that Facebook would become the destination to connect to friends and share information, text, photos, or social events. All that you need to do is sign up, create a profile, find your mates, and have them agree to become your Facebook friend. In this way, each Facebook member carves out their own group of friends, all within the larger network. You'll see that what we're building is a massive network of real connections between people through which information can flow more efficiently than it really ever has in the past. And it's changing the way the world works. But to change the way the world works, or putting it a bit more cynically to build up marketing potential, 
Facebook needs to attract a huge number of users. What Facebook is trying to achieve is something called a network effect. This is a term coined 100 years ago by American telephone industrialist Theodore Vail. This is the essence of what Theodore Vail outlined. If you have a telephone, just one, it's pretty useless because you can pick it up, but there's nobody on the other side. There's no one to make a connection with. But if you add another telephone, add another, and another, and another, and another. This guy can talk with this guy, who can talk with this guy, who can talk with this guy, and so on, and so on. The more phones you have connected, the more benefits for the individual users, because the user has more possibilities of people to connect with. And the more people that they can connect with, the more other people will want to join. The system becomes self-sustaining and self-fulfilling. It's as simple as that. So the power and value of Facebook increases by the number of friends it connects. Many of these things are a sort of scale leads to scale. That is, if your friends are on it, you go on it. You don't do some objective evaluation of this one is better in this way and that one's better in that way. You know, it's like, why is, is the phone, you know, with its dial, why did that catch on? Well, critical mass eventually becomes the very big thing. Um, you know, for a while, Facebook forced you to be friends with somebody if they wanted to be friends with you. And that, you know, that didn't happen to work for me because I was getting 10,000 friends requests a day. People will have the experience of having thousands of friends. Right? Well, no one really has thousands of friends. It's, 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 it's either the word thousands or the word friends has to be struck out for that, for that sentence to make any sense. We've seen how Facebook needs volume. The problem is the commodity it wants to accumulate is human relationships. So what does that mean for those relationships? What does it mean to have 10,000 friends? Could a Facebook friend be something as trivial, cheap and disposable as fast food? Worth no more than a burger? Seriously. In 2009, a well-known fast food chain created a page on Facebook that offered the chance of a free Whopper for people who defriended 10 of their Facebook friends. In less than two weeks, the love of a Whopper proved stronger than 233,906 friendships. This brazen marketing stunt surprisingly seems to reveal something fascinating about the value of our Facebook friends. The underlying issue was, you're on here, we're all on this Facebook, we all love it, it's fun, great, but like, what's the point? Steve Schiff was one of thousands of Facebook users who decided to trade in his online friends for a grilled piece of meat in a bun. How do you choose which, you know, which to get rid of first? To be honest with you, it was incredibly easy. Okay. I mean, it was not that tough to find 10 people that I really didn't need to have that online connection with. This isn't something that's happening in real life, so let's just cut to the chase, let's cut our losses, let's go get our free burgers, and everybody wins. So if we're willing to get rid of friends for a burger, does that mean social networks are changing the face of friendships in the 21st century? Or are there some immutable aspects of human friendship that Facebook can't change? I need to find out more about the evolution of relationships itself. I'm meeting the world authority on primate groups, Oxford professor Robin Dunbar. Can you talk me through what's going on here? What's the social life of a, of a primate group? About. It's all about social bonding, personalised relationships between individuals. Primates live in a really intensely social world. They spend a lot of time grooming each other. Uh, that sort of gives them the sense of bonding. 
The, the problem with grooming is it's a one-on-one -on -one 